Hello and welcome everyone. I'm John M. Hawkins. The show is My Strategy and we're coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Today we're going to be talking about well-being, the importance of well-being, the different types of well-being. We're going to learn how to promote and maintain well-being for remote employees, the reasons many companies need well-being programs, and how to build an effective well-being strategy. Well, again, welcome everyone and very happy to be here. Um, Saturday is a great day of the week to reflect on my strategy, uh, but keep in mind that any time is a great time for you to reflect on your strategy. And that's what the My Strategy Show is all about, is personal development. The My Strategy Show continues to grow. We're available on iHeart, iTunes, Player FM, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spreaker, and more. So if you'd like to listen to this in podcast form or any of our past episodes, you can find them there. You can find me on most social media platforms. My Twitter handle is at Hawkins John. So that's Hawkins John. Or you can go to my website, which is johnmhawkins.com. It's johnmhawkins.com. And just like anything in life, we need to have a strategy and a plan to help us reach our goals because the best laid plans don't always work. This week, I'm looking for stories on well-being. If you have any examples, a tip, or a trick, you can send it to talk at johnmhawkins.com. That's talk at johnmhawkins.com. Well, today we're going to be talking about well-being. We're going to be going through what exactly is well-being. What does it mean? There's uh, many different definitions, so we're going to go through a number of the uh, main theoretical perspectives and try and understand a little bit more about what it is. We're going to talk about the ways to improve well-being. Uh, what are some of the things we can do uh, with regard to well-being? We're going to talk then a little bit about promoting and maintaining well-being in this remote workforce world now that uh, many of us, most of us, I guess I should say, have been uh, pushed into uh, we're going to talk about why it's important for organizations to invest in their employees. And I want to look at this not only from a company perspective, but from an individual contributor, because many times uh, organizations will try and push these initiatives top down, when in reality, the people who really are going to benefit are the individual contributors, those who are working for these companies and organizations. So we want to understand it from our own personal development perspective and we want to provide feedback to the organizations and companies we work for so that they have more insight into how to effectively build their strategy and then we are going to go through and talk about how to effectively build a well-being strategy many times the ad hoc approach doesn't work and it's important to have a strategy but i assumed that you would expect me to say that we're going to be working on strategy since the show is my strategy, and that is what we focus on. All right, I'd like to start with Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Definition of well-being. It says here, the state of being happy, healthy, or prosperous. They say, see welfare. Some of the synonyms uh, for well-being are good, interest, welfare. The antonym is ill-being, and the first use of the word well-being was in 1561. It's according to Merriam-Webster. I think you're going to find that while the definition starts off and talks about one thing, as we go through these various perspectives and points of view, you're going to find that uh, I'm not sure if there is a consensus yet on well-being. But uh, let's, let's continue and, and see what we can find. So I'd like to start off with an article by Stephen Joseph. He says, what exactly is well-being? He says, new research lists the 14 different components of well-being. The importance of well-being has been widely acknowledged over the past 20 years by psychologists. But the concept itself is surprisingly complex in a recent study which aimed to bring some order to the confusion. Dr. Yenio Longo at the University of Nottingham in England examined the similarities and differences in the six most widely used theoretical perspectives on well-being. 
looking for similarities and differences across the six theoretical perspectives and how they define well-being. He identified 14 distinct and reoccurring constructs that are used to describe well-being. The constructs are happiness, vitality, calmness, optimism, involvement, self-awareness, self-acceptance, self-worth, competence, development, purpose, significance, congruence, and connection. The definition for each he goes through, and I'm going to go through a few of these. Happiness, feeling happy and cheerful. Vitality, feeling energetic, full of energy. Calmness, feeling calm and relaxed. Optimism, being optimistic and hopeful. Involvement, feeling completely involved and engaged in what you do. Awareness, being in touch with how you feel. Acceptance, accepting yourself the way you are. Self-worth, liking yourself. Competence, feeling highly effective at what you do. Development, feeling you are improving, developing, advancing. Purpose, having a purpose and a mission in life. Significance, feeling that what you do is worthwhile. Congruence, feeling what you do is consistent, consistent with how you see yourself. Connection, feeling close and connected to the people around you. He says, looking down this list, which ones would you agree are true for you? Now, I think it's important for us to add some additional context, color to well-being, because quite frankly, when I hear well-being as a term, you know, we've talked about perspectives and everyone has a different perspective. The term well-being is going to mean something different for everyone. And when one person says well-being, they might think it has to do with development or they might think it has to do with calmness or happiness. But you're going to find as we go through the show that there's a number of different perspectives on what well-being is all about. So as we try and put together our personal development strategy, it's important for us in the early part of the show to keep our minds open, to really understand what well-being means, what it is, and what it isn't. The better we understand a problem statement, the better we understand what the nuances, intricacies, and all of the different elements to it are, the better off we are in terms of putting together a strategy. And that's true of all the things we talk about on a weekly basis. It's really understanding what it's about. So that's one perspective uh, from Stephen Joseph on what well-being is about. Well-being is very common nowadays. I mean, I know that uh, there's many organizations. For example, I've got the CDC. Uh, they're talking about why it's important and, and many other organizations. You're listening to My Strategy. I am your host, John M. Hawkins, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to continue to talk about well-being. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm John M. Hawkins. The show is My Strategy, and we're coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Glad you can join us. Today we're talking about well-being. Talking about well-being right before the break. Uh, we were talking about some different perspectives on well-being, what it means. In this segment, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the well-being topic. And I've got an article from Tajiki Davis. It's called, What is Well-Being? Definitions, Types, and Well-Being Skills. Tajiki starts out by saying, well-being is the experience of health, happiness, and prosperity. It includes having a good mental health, high life satisfaction, sense of meaning and purpose, ability to manage stress more generally. Well-being is just the feeling well. She provides a link for a little quiz you can take if you're interested in Googling that. Uh, you can take the quiz. 
She goes on to say, well-being is something sought by just about everyone because it includes so many positive things, feeling happy, healthy, socially connected, and purposeful. Unfortunately, well-being appears to be on the decline, at least in the United States, and increasing your well-being can be tough without knowing what to do. She goes on to talk a little bit about the institute that she had founded uh, to focus on this topic. She says, can you actually improve your well-being? Well, Tajiki, like uh, others, say that this is a very complex topic. She said, increasing your well-being is simple. There's tons of skills you can build, but increasing your well-being is not always easy. Figuring out what parts of well-being are most important for you and figuring out how exactly to build well-being skills usually will require some help. How long does it take to improve your well-being? She says, usually when people start consistently using science-based techniques for enhancing their well-being, they begin to feel better pretty quickly. In the study she's conducted and read, most people show significant improvement within five weeks, which isn't too bad, right? Feeling down and out, improved well-being. But she says you have to stick to it. If you're feeling better after five weeks, you cannot just stop there, which is why. Well, you probably already know that if you stop eating healthy and go back to eating junk food, then you'll end up right back where you started. Turns out the exact same thing is true for different types of well-being. If you want to maintain the benefits you gain, you'll have to continue to engage in well-being boosting activities. She says, here's what you need to know. Where does well-being come from? She says, well-being emerges from your thoughts, actions, and experiences, most of which you have control over. For example, when we think positive, we tend to have greater emotional well-being. When we pursue meaningful relationships, we tend to have better social well-being. And when we lose our job or just hate it, we tend to have lower workplace well-being. These examples start to re reveal how broad well-being is and how many different types of well-being there are. She talks about five different types of well-being. She says there's the emotional well-being, the ability to practice stress management techniques, be resilient, generate emotions that lead to good feelings. Next type, physical well-being, the ability to improve the functioning of your body through healthy eating and good exercise habits. Social well-being, the ability to communicate, develop meaningful relationships with others, and maintain a social network that helps you overcome loneliness. Workplace well-being. The ability to pursue your interests, values, and purpose in order to gain meaning, happiness, enrichment professionally. Societal well-being. The ability to actively participate in a thriving community, culture, and environment. So I think it's interesting how Tachiki has identified these five different well-being types. And if we compare that to what we learned in our first segment... Um, the author had 14 different, I believe it was 14 different types of well-being out there. So we're just trying to find out more so we can uncover and understand really what the meaning of well-being is. She says, to build your overall well-being, you have to make sure all these types are functioning to an extent. Think of it this way. Imagine you're in a car. Your engine works great. Maybe your transmission works pretty well, too, but your brakes don't work because your brakes don't work. It doesn't really matter how well your engine works. You're going to have trouble going about your life. I guess that's true, right? I mean, brakes and tires are probably the most important things you can have on an automobile. At least that's what my grandfather always told me. She goes on to talk about the various types of well-being. She says emotional well-being. To develop emotional well-being, we need to build emotional skills like positive thinking, emotional regulation, and mindfulness. Some skills that suggest contribute to emotional well-being are happiness skills, mindfulness skills, positive thinking, resilience. Physical well-being. To develop our physical well-being, we need to know what a healthy diet and exercise routine looks like. Consider eating for health, detoxing your body, correcting nutritional deficiencies. Social well-being. To develop social well-being, we need to build our social skills like gratitude, kindness, and communication. Social skills make it easy for us to have positive impact on others. 
She talks a little bit about how it's important to know that building social skills is one of the best ways to build emotional well-being as well. Workplace well-being. To develop our workplace well-being, we need to build skills to help us pursue that what really matters to us. It's going to include building professional skills, which helps us to advance more effectively, like maintaining work-life balance, finding your purpose. Societal well-being. To develop societal well-being, we need to build skills that make us feel interconnected with all things, like living your values, kindness, making a positive impact in other people's lives. Those are her five areas and some ideas of where to focus. She says there's no magic about building well-being. Keep in mind it takes time and effort to build any new skill set. That includes well-being skills. It's important to be realistic with you about what you can reasonably accomplish in a given amount of time. Having unrealistic expectations can lead you to give up before you've reached your well-being goals. So it's key to create a realistic plan for your well-being. I think that's what we are all about on this show, right? Every week we talk about personal development and my five-step process to building strategy. It's no different with well-being, and while many of the constructs that we're exploring have to do with soft skills, values, you kind of see how we have, you know, this well-being concept uh, really is a repurposing of many other things that we focus on with regard to soft skills, being happy, uh, and things of that nature. So, you know, I think it's really important for us to really understand that, you know, well-being, based on the couple of different point of views that we've seen today, means something different for each person. Maybe that's my takeaway, is we're going to need to come up with some sort of definition and problem statement so we can figure out how to solve it. You're listening to My Strategy. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to talk about well-being for remote workers. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm John M. Hawkins. The show is My Strategy, and we're coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Our radio shows are live, and they're on Saturdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Today, we're talking about well-being. Right before the break, we were going through a different perspective, point of view on what well-being is, definitions, different types of well-being. In this segment, I want to talk a little bit about promoting and maintaining well-being for remote employees, which I don't know about many, but now most of us probably have found ourselves having to do some sort of work from home um, over the past uh, few months. I've got an article here by Stuart Hearn. Now, this is dated right before we did have the pandemic, but I do think there's uh, lots of relevant information here about remote working, and, um, you know, it, it just goes to show you that uh, it's prophetic in the sense that uh, what he's talking about became the reality. Stewart says, 14 ways to promote and maintain mental well-being of remote employees. I think it's important. We're learning about perspectives, and I know they've ta we've talked in a prior segment about you know physical well-being, um, societal well-being, and other types. This one focuses on the mental well-being. And, th and this is part of what I'm trying to understand about the well-being topic is, you know, well-being is so complex. And really, to me, it, it's almost like people use it to define what life is and what we go through on a daily basis. And they just use the term well-being. So I'm really trying to understand it so that uh, from a personal development perspective, when we hear the term well-being, we, we know what to think about and we know what it means. Stewart says, employee wellness is a growing concern for many managers and human resources. As recent figures show that millions are lost each year due to work-related stress, anxiety, and depression. The American Institute of Stress reports that 80% of people feel stressed on the job. Now, 80%, that is a lot of people feeling stressed on the job. He says, respondents also reported an increase in calling in sick or feeling physical pain from stress. 
At the same time, we're seeking a massive increase in remote working. He says with almost 50% of the U.S. workforce expected to be remote or partly remote by 2027. We'll add the pandemic on top of that, and we might be closer to uh, 80 or 90 percent. I'm, I'm guessing here. I don't know. We need to find out. If you manage employees who work remotely, either partially or entirely, it's fair to ask your organization, how are they promoting mental well-being for these remote employees? It says working remotely comes with its own pressures and challenges. While telecuting, telecommuting employees may escape the dreaded morning commute and loud, distracting co-workers, they are susceptible to feeling isolation, lack of connection to their company, inability to maintain a healthy life work balance. So he goes on to talk about his experiences with it, and he provides some suggestions on how we can be a little healthier about mental health. He says, we need to take mental health as serious as our physical health. Generally, people don't take mental health as serious as physical. In fact, according to a study published in the journal Health Affairs, this is true even of doctors, with many of them failing to follow up with their patients after a diagnosis of depression. Just because a belief is popular, that doesn't make it right. Mental health disorders can be debilitating, and employees who suffer from them deserve support and encouragement. He talks about some things you can do from a mental health perspective, and, and these doctors who have diagnosed someone are not following up, which if your employer diagnoses a situation and they don't follow up, what does that tell you about the importance of it? What about setting up a virtual water cooler? According to a recent study, 48% of remote workers admit to feeling lonely, with 46% claiming freelancing can be isolating. Remote workers often work in this way because it suits their lifestyles and commitments or productivity rhythms. But all humans are innately social creatures. They need to interact, and communication is of utmost importance. Companies with remote workers should accommodate this by setting up a virtual water cooler. Virtual water coolers. There's an idea. Hold regular check-ins to ensure the mental health the mental well-being of remote employees, managers should hold regular check-ins with their telecommuting staff members. Use this as an opportunity to build rapport and trust, discuss goals, progress, struggles, development opportunities. You should also deliver praise, acknowledge, and recognition. And I love this because, you know, every week we talk about strategy. And, you know, it's a very systematic approach. There's five steps. If you're in a cadence with your manager and you're not talking about goals and accomplishments and talking about other things, you know, maybe start introducing that topic. It can help you uh, feel like you're on track, accomplishing goals, gives you some something to work for. The unsick day, another idea from this author. One exciting idea you can think of is the unsick day. This is a scheme piloted by Buffer where every employee is encouraged to take at least one day off a year to look into Preventative treatments, such as dentist appointments, counselings, eye exam. People can use this day in any way that caters to their well-being. Provide reimbursement for fitness activities. We know that physical activity has benefited. It can also have a huge impact on mental. Of course, now it's hard. Uh, you know, Many of the gyms are not open or they have limited capacity or have shuttered totally. But still, we need to think about our physical health. Encourage employees to separate work and private life. Set realistic, smart objectives. I like this one. I, I love the smart goals. Those are a good idea. Be open to flexible working. Flexible benefits. Flexibility benefits everyone by shifting focus to goals achieved rather than hours completed. Employees working remotely will be able to schedule and work around counseling doctor's appointments in the middle of the day. Encourage breaks. They're good for employees and business. How many hours a day do you spend sitting at your desk? According to one source, office workers spend an upwards of 1,700 hours a year in front of a computer screen. This takes a toll on your focus, motivation, and, and health. Finally, he says you might want to have a walking meeting rather than holding your meeting at a desk. Take it on the go. He gives some other ideas as well. 
You're listening to My Strategy. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins, coming live from the BVM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to talk about why it's important for companies to invest in World Bank. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm John M. Hawkins. The show is My Strategy, where we focus on personal development. Today we've been talking about well-being, talking about the importance of well-being, talking about uh, the different types of well-being, promoting and maintaining well-being, reason companies need well-being programs, and how to build a well-being strategy. This topic fits right in with the show, My Strategy. Our show is all about personal development, and uh, we are live and on live on Saturdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. All right before the break, we were talking about promoting and maintaining well-being for remote employees. In this segment, I want to talk a little bit about why companies need to invest in well-being. I said at the top of the show that while it's important for you know companies to focus on well-being, I also think it's important for us as individuals to own our own well-being. Because at the end of the day, these corporate type of well-being programs are, are top-down. But they're really designed to benefit us, those of us in these companies' organizations. And we should have a say in that, right? Um, at the end of the day, if somebody is doing something to make you a better person, more productive, we need, we need to have a say and we need to have some input. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. This article I've got here is from Inc. Magazine. It says, why you need to invest in your employees' well-being and how to do it. It also says here as the subheader, wellness programs as we currently think of them fall short of reality. By now, most employers understand that Workplace wellness needs to play some role in their strategies. But wellness, as we currently think of it, falls short. While fitness trackers and healthy snack programs are a good first step, we need to move away from thinking about wellness and instead think about well-being. Most wellness initiatives today focus on a person's physical health, not their overall well-being, which can lead to a lack of engagement and wasteful spending. An effective approach to Overall well-being begins with understanding that the barriers that employees face in their everyday lives will prevent them from finding their health. So that's, again, you know, I think we've learned, we've had several different point of views in this show today. And each of the point of views has some similarities, but that's, you know, when I said that this was a very complex topic, it really is because we've had different points of views. There's some alignment, but there's not really anything that's concrete and congruent to look at well-being and say this is exactly what well-being is. In this, in this point of view, in this article, they talk about three keys to employee health. Nancy Reardon, Chief Strategy and Product Officer at Maestro Health, believes this is far, there's far more to be done. She feels that we need to look at a more holistic view of our employees, including mental health, emotional health, stress management, preventative care options, and more. She highlights these three key areas of employee health and provides some well-being strategies a leader can implement to achieve a more thoughtful approach to an employee's health. Now keep in mind, she's talking about these three components but in today's day and age, societal well-being is one of those issues that is not being addressed properly. There's violence, there's protests, there's lots of things going on, there's social isolation. So even when you do commit to a strategy, and you've got these three different components here that she's identified, what about societal? Now that one has bubbled up to the top. In any event, she goes through these three different areas. She says, while this is the most obvious component of employee health and well-being, Reardon says it's these traditional healthy 
choices and actions that help your employee avoid chronic conditions that can ultimately affect their emotional and financial health. For example, medical bills and debt. And what's the, the amount of stress and pressure put on an employee because of bills and debt? Employer-sponsored benefit and wellness programs that drive education and engagement are critical components in driving physical health, Reardon says. Employees need to understand how they should access health care to ensure they remain on track to achieving their health. For some employees, it may be hitting 10,000 steps on their Fitbit. For others, it may be seeing a decrease in their A1C levels in order to decrease the high risk of developing diabetes. Financial health. Reardon stress is a critical link between physical health and financial health and vice versa, and how one affects the other. She says, for example, an employee even with one moderate salary and benefits may be unable to afford or access health care, healthy food options, and more. Similarly, Reardon says employees who can't cope with financial pressures at home may develop health issues down the line. Reardon advises employers to offer their workers access to financial services and resources to help them understand and overcome financial obstacles and empower them. And that's where I see this well-being construct becoming this overarching you know, view of almost everything we do on a daily basis. And a lot of what they're describing here about financial pressures, you know, to me, it's stress management and soft skills that we can develop. So that's, again, where I'm having a little bit of the, 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 the conflict in my mind about what exactly is well-being. Emotional health. Emotional well-being is impacted by both financial and physical health. Yet all employees have the capability to emotionally cope with the ups and downs of life without impacting their day-to-day. She says when crafting their well-being programs, Rudin says employees can offer mental health services like mental health days, employee assistance, and more. She says bottom line, employers play a huge part in their employees' overall health and well-being. And ultimately, they feel the impact if something is going wrong or goes wrong physical, financial, and emotional health are all intertwined and must be addressed if you want to have better, more productive employees. So again, another view into why it's important for companies to invest in well-being programs for their employees. I think my takeaway is that, you know, at the end of the day, this well-being topic is a little bit of a moving target and also you know, what's important for the individuals in the organization might be different from what the managers of the organization say. So it's important to provide your feedback. You're listening to My Strategy. I am your host, John M. Hawkins, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to talk about how to develop an effective health and well-being strategy. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm John M. Hawkins. The show is my strategy. We're live on Saturdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Today we've been talking about well-being, talking about the importance of well-being, the meaning, the types, promoting well-being, reasons companies need well-being programs, and more. Right before the break, we were talking about why companies need to invest in well-being. But we're at that time of the show where We need to start talking about strategy because um, I think we've got a pretty good handle. At least i got a better handle on what well-being is all about. But the show is my strategy, and we talk about our five-step process, which we go through every week. It's awareness. What are you trying to do? What's your goal, vision, et cetera? We assess and analyze it, right? We look at the situation, provide data. We strategize and plan, come up with some courses of actions where we can determine ones that are going to help us get to the goal. Implement your plan. Start executing on the courses of actions. Support and evaluate. And I know it might sound, you know, we got these five steps. It's, But really, the goal is, if you think about these five steps once a week, so on this show, you think about those five steps, and you just kind of plan out one thing that way. And then you go to, well, maybe I'm going to do it on Sunday, too. And maybe I'm going to do it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. If you start 
to get into this mindset where you're using this five-step approach every time you're trying to solve a problem. At some point, you're going to be really good at using the approach. It's going to be secondhand. It's going to come natural, not going to be cumbersome. And ultimately, it's going to help you uh, think strategically and also be able to execute on those. All right, so what I want to talk about now is how to develop an effective health and well-being strategy. And I'm providing this because while I provide my five-step plan, my five-step approach, everybody else has a different way to do it. And so I'm going to share with you what Helen Smith says with regard to how to effectively develop it. Again, they talk about you know the importance of bringing fruit and doing yoga into the organization, but she says it's much more than that. It's how your company demonstrates the value of their people's lives and how you will support them to leading healthy and fulfilling lives, both inside and outside of work. And again, we need, if you're not managing and building the vision for an organization, provide this feedback up. She says this all can be very complex. Many companies decide to implement well-being initiatives in an ad hoc way without considering what their employees really want or need and what might be most cost-effective for them in their industry. She says, whilst this approach may have good intentions, it may not necessarily lend itself to creating a cohesive plan or strategy which can be evaluated, tweaked, and improved upon. Developing a cohesive health and well-being strategy can help a company be clear about their objectives, where they need to prioritize interventions and activity and help them think about how effectiveness is measured. All right, we need to be purposeful. To help companies plan and develop their health and well-being strategies, Brennan worked with Jane Abraham, a health and well-being specialist and managing director of Flourish Workplace, to create a useful guide, which is what we are going through in this segment. Now, this is not to be confused with the five-step program or five-step process we do every week on the show. This is another point of view. Stage one, begin your planning process. Before you dive right in and start thinking about initiatives, it's important to think through and plan your approach. You should consider, what are the main drivers for implementing the strategy? What do the employees want and need? Who is responsible for what? What is the current offering and are there gaps? What are your competitors offering? Step two, gain manager buy-in. It's vital that senior management understand the value of health and well-being strategy to ensure you have support and designated resources and budget. To secure buy-in, you should present tangible data with necessary management tools in place to showcase this. I love what, what she's done here because she's now going in and doing the data. This is the analysis, and that's what we do in step two. But she says... Sickness records. Identify how much sickness is affected in your company and identify the key causes. Employee demographics. Identify any well-being needs in each demographic. Existing initiatives. Use data from existing initiatives. Employee assistance programs to understand how people are using the service. Exit surveys or employee engagement surveys to identify themes or trends related to health and well-being. We need data, effective data, to be able to make decisions and develop our strategy. And I like that she takes that approach. Number three is develop your strategy. Once you have buy-in, develop your strategy. Set out your vision, goals, and objectives. Use your research and key priorities. I think also I would add in here, it's important to have a charter. It's important to have you know core values if they're different than or update the organizational core values to include well-being. It's one of those areas that you're focusing on aspirationally where you're going. Identify and use champions who can promote the initiative. Communicate examples of real change. Create and send a regular newsletter. I love these components. Communication. Make sure that uh, you're getting that information out and have champions because at the end of the day, the top down doesn't always work. You need champions who are living, breathing examples of well-being. Five is review and refresh. Ensure that you regularly review the data and KPIs to check that you're on track. If something is not working, try to find out why and if something can be done to improvement. Don't be afraid to evolve and change elements in the strategy. 
she does provide a full guide here. She says whilst it might seem like a large task, it's clear that developing an effective and well-being strategy is extremely beneficial to your company. So that is uh, another viewpoint um, on how to develop an effective health and well-being strategy. Again, you know, I think this is important for us in this show to think about our own personal development, our personal well-being, our, our own mindset, and really figure out what are the important elements in our own lives. Are we happy and are we, do we have well-being at work? Is it societal well-being? Is it health? Is it something else? And that's where we need to really understand ourselves. We need to understand what is working for us, what is not working for us. And by having that clarity and that better definition, it's going to give us an opportunity to create our strategy. You're listening to my strategy. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to tell you how to put your plan in place. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome back, everyone. I'm John M. Hawkins. The show is My Strategy. We're coming to you live from the BVM Global Network and Tune In Radio. My Strategy shows are live and on Saturdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. And in case you missed this broadcast, uh, you can go back and listen on iHeartRadio, Apple iTunes. And if you'd like to have something covered in the show, send an email to talk at johnmhawkins.com. That's talk at johnmhawkins.com. Or you can uh, pick up the phone or voice over IP and give us a call at 844-MY-STRATEGY. That's 844-MY-STRATEGY. Well, today we've been talking about well-being, the importance of different types of well-being, and much more. I think from my perspective, we first had to learn what well-being was all about. Well-being has been something that is widely acknowledged by psychologists. We're seeing it more and more in workplace, but really there doesn't seem to be a consistent definition. We learned that Dr. Lenio Longo started looking for similarities across the six theoretical perspectives of well-being, and he identified many of the attributes, such as happiness, vitality, calmness, optimism, involvement, awareness, acceptance, and many more. But we know that it, it didn't really stop there. Another point of view taught us uh, something a little bit different about it. And while they were, we talked about how you can improve well-being, how long does it take, we learned that, you know, based on evidence, that it can take, you know, five weeks of doing something can help you get it ingrained. But it's not just five weeks that you need to spend. It's something that needs to be persistent. In this point of view, we learned that there were five different types of well-being, and they classified it as the emotional well-being, physical well-being, social well-being, workplace well-being, and societal well-being. I think it's important to think about, as there's all these different types of well-being, why it's so important for us to understand the context in which well-being is being referred to and to ask the questions, what do you mean by well-being? We learned that promoting and maintaining well-being is very important for remote employees. Working remotely comes with its own set of problems. It can be lonely. You can find that you're not being engaged as much not working on goals and objectives. And it's important to take your mental health as serious as the physical health by setting up virtual water coolers, unsick days where you might consider scheduling all of your important annual checkups and appointments. It's not just physical health or emotional. Financial well-being comes into play. You know, Having medical bills or lots of debt can impact how you perform at work. We then talked a little bit about how to develop an effective health and well-being strategy. How many companies are focusing on an ad hoc approach to well-being. But it's important to really develop a cohesive plan 
and develop a well-being strategy. Because as we learn from all the various different point of views, well-being can mean many different things to most everyone. So if everyone has a different perspective, and I mentioned the term well-being, what does it mean? So we need to be very specific with it. And it's important for us to go through this in a strategic process where we plan it, get buy-in, strategize, review, and refresh. But again, it's important for us as individuals and in trying to work on our personal development to think about how we're going to break some of these bad habits. And first and foremost, it's important for us to be aware that there's a pattern or something that we might need help with. So if you have awareness that well-being is something you need to work on, that's the first step. We then need to really prioritize and commit to those changes, to those goals, to realize that well-being is something we want to work on. Because when we apply focus to something, we stand a better chance. And coaching can help provide clarity. The more clarity you have, the easier things are. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.